Hello everyone, you're all welcome for today's panel, which called the Safe Haven Freedom Talk about Uyghurs. This panel was started by, uh, arranged by the, the Malmö Sividen, Malmö City Culture Department, which uh, today we are sitting here. So that the, today's uh, panel uh, will be chaired by Dr. Wona Stenbey. So from now, I will pass it to you. Please, stage is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to both the museum and to Uyghur Pen uh, for organizing this talk and for hosting it. Um, I, my name is Rune Stingberg. I am an anthropologist uh, focused on Uyghur and Xinjiang or East Turkestan studies at the Palatsky University in Olomouc. Uh, and I today have the, the honor of um, chairing and moderating this panel, um, which for which we've been very lucky to gather uh, a lot of uh, international experts, uh, quite well known um, across the scene of both people in academia and also in politics and in activism, looking at the very worrying developments in uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region or East Turkestan, as it is also known over the last few years. But some of you who are visiting and, and listening in on this might not be uh, familiar with every one of these. So therefore, um, the way we're going to proceed now is I will briefly introduce each of our panelists and then move on to um, give the word to each of them in turn um, to their opening and introductory statement. After this, we will have a more general discussion. Um, I will be asking some questions and we also take questions from the audience. You can send it um, to us uh, on the Facebook page, I believe, um, uh, and also on WhatsApp. Uh, it should all be the, the, the information for how to send in the questions should all be in the, uh, on, the, on the event description on the Facebook page. So without further ado, I would like to start introducing Jua Ilham, um, a graduate from Indiana University um, and a campaigner for uh, human rights, uh, Uyghur's rights, and also for the release of her father a uh, renowned uh, professor of economics, Ilham Tohti, who has been imprisoned um, um, unrightfully um, for, uh, since 2014. Um, Dura Ilham works for the, uh, is an associate at the Workers' Right Consortium um, at the moment. Then we have Dolkun Isa, uh, former pro-democracy student leader uh, from the 1980s who came to Europe in the 90s and co-founded the World Uyghur Congress of which he is, is uh, the current president. Um, he has received a number of international prizes for his human rights work and advocacy and is also or has also served as the vice president of the unrepresented nations um, of, uh, and people's organization of the uh, United Nations. Then we have Sairai Gul Saudbaiva, um, a former leader or, or head of five kindergartens in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Oblast uh, region. She was back then still a staunch believer in the system um, until she became a teacher in a re-education camp between 2017 and 2018. Um, and in 2018, in the summer, was able to flee to Kazakhstan, um, was imprisoned there, uh, put on trials, and um, later released. She now lives in Sweden and has just published a book on her experiences in the camps. Uh, she's also received the 
award of the International Women's of Women of Courage. Um, Razigul Asim, uh, also a witness of the Chinese clampdown uh, in East Turkestan. She had settled in Albania after studying geography and working in tourism and also studying English. Uh, settled in Albania in 2010, but returned uh, to um, East Turkestan in 2017, where she experienced the Chinese crackdown, especially also um, touching upon her family. We have Nuri Turkel, um, the president of the Uyghur American Association and chairman of the board of the Uyghur Human Rights Project, also a, a co-founder of this project, um, and also more recently the commissioner of the U.S. Commission um, on International Religious Freedom. And lastly, we have a co-organizer of this event, um, Kaiser Özgün. Um, he is the president of the International Uyghur Pen Center, uh, himself a cultural anthropologist, also uh, artist and uh, software developer and designer. And he's a founding member of the Pen International Uyghur Center. So all of these people we here bring together in the panel today um, will be discussing the latest developments, especially over the last few years, but also hopefully the newest developments uh, taking place in East Turkestan, also known as Uyghur, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, where we since 2014 have seen um, a very harsh government clampdown on the local Uyghur, Kazakh and other minority populations uh, that in 2016 escalated into um, mass internment uh, camps, uh, mass incarceration on a scale not seen since the Cultural Revolution and probably not even then, um, uh, an extreme international human rights uh, crisis uh, and uh, crimes. Um, and uh, our panelists have all experienced this on their own bodies, basically, um, through their families and some of them even personally, uh, directly. Um, today, we have a chance to talk to them about it, to ask them about their experiences and also about the work that they do now, because what all of these panelists also have in common is that they are very active um, in informing the world about what has been going on and what is going on in the region, and also in working towards solutions, um, both for the Uyghurs and the region, but also for other peoples and for the problems, the worldwide uh, developments that this has uh, in part arisen out of. So because Jua Ilham is our, um, has to leave early, she will be the first one um, to whom I will give the word. Um, and Joa, I would, I would like to start out asking you to tell us a little bit about your father uh, and how you came to uh, be an activist on his behalf and also on the behalf of the Uyghurs in general. Please, you have the word. Thank you very much, Aruni, for your wonderful introduction. And um, hello, everyone. My name is Jawhar Alham. Um, as, um, as a daughter, I would like to start by sharing uh, some of my personal stories and how I became an advocate for my father and for the Uyghur people. Um, when I was a kid, I thought I wanted to be a dancer or a translator. Uh, and my father really encouraged me to get on the translating path. But then a lot, whole lots of things happened and dis disrupted my plans. I happen to be the daughter of Ilham Tohti, uh, who many of you may know. For those who don't know my father, uh, Ilham Tohti, uh, my father is a well-known Uyghur economist who is now serving a life sentence in China for fostering dialogue between the Han Chinese and the Uyghur people and for um, advocating respect for religious and culture beliefs um, of our people and for equal uh, opportunity in pursuing our dreams and the things that actually motivate us. Um, 
February 2nd, 2013. I would never forget that date. Uh, my father and I were on our way to America together, and he was to be a visiting scholar at Indiana University, where I also when I went, where I went to school and graduated. Um, he was stopped at the airport and prevented from leaving the country. And I was a teenager. I was a freshman. I just uh, became a freshman in college at that time. I was studying Arabic and hoping to become a translator. I was planning to stay in the U.S. for two to three weeks and help my father settle down. But as you can see, I'm still here and never left. And at the same time, I'm on the other side of the world away from my family and my home. And that was the last time I saw my father in person and my br younger brothers as well. After I left the country, my father was under house arrest for 11 months. It wasn't the first time um, he was put under house arrest. Uh, he used to always tell me, after he was released, he used to always tell me, it's okay, it's okay, Balam, it's okay, my child. And he would continue his work and I would just remain silent. And I thought, okay, maybe it was okay. On January 15th, 2014, um, my father was taken away and disappeared for more than three months uh, without any word. Uh, that was a time I knew it wasn't okay anymore and I couldn't remain silent. So you see the motivation to do the work I am doing now is very uh, personal. Um, up to 2017, I was mainly advocating for the right only for my father, uh, for my family. And when I learned that hundreds of thousands of families were experiencing similar or even worse treatments. Um, that was a time I knew it wasn't okay anymore and I couldn't remain silent for, um, to, I, I knew I had to st start advocating for the, for the rights of my people as well. Um, as many of you may already know, over the last few years, it is estimated that there are over uh, one to 1.8 million Uyghurs and um, members of other predominantly Muslim minorities, such as uh, Kazakhs and Kyrgyz, have been sent to uh, re-education camps or forced labor centers, which I call them concentration camps, uh, where they face a number of abuses. And in fact, recently, the uh, when many people argue, how do you get the numbers and how do you prove that the, these camps existed? Actually, the government uh, proved it themselves just a few weeks ago. Um, the State Council Information Office of China released a white paper uh, stating that since 2014, um, there are over 1, 1.29 million people per year passing through vocational training centers. And I, I, I, I think this is one of the many terms the Chinese government uses to refer to internment and re-education camps or concentration camps. And which I, I think this constitutes the largest um, mass detention of an ethno religious community since the World War II. Um, for the past few years, the Chinese government is also transporting um, the Uyghurs and other Turkic and uh, uh, Muslim uh, people to other parts of China where they are working in factories under conditions that strongly indicate forced labor. And those are systematic and state-sponsored forms of forced labor, which intersects with other types of uh, human rights abuses, which includes forced sterilization, um, uh, family separation, destruction of the agriculture, um, which uh, in order to uh, wipe out century-old cultural landmarks, undermining the Uyghur culture, and arbitrary uh, detention, um, political indoctrination um, and, and pervasive surveillance, which, um, um, uh, which I will have to lead to uh, the topic of what, what I'm currently working on. So I'm currently mainly working on the forced labor issues, um, the mechanisms that brands, retailers, and independent labor rights inspectors would normally use to investigate possible uh, forced labor is impossible in China because the Chinese government has placed the entire region in a um, wise grip of repression and surveillance and terror. Um, this makes it impossible for any worker suffering coercion to tell the truth to an investigator or an auditor. So given the impossible task of uh, conducting, 
conducting um, due diligence in the Uyghur region, I strongly encourage brands to sign on to the brand commitment to exit the Uyghur region, uh, which is what I'm currently focusing on. Um, this, brand, uh, this brand commitment to exit the Uyghur region, which is initiated, initiated by the coalition to end Uyghur forced labor, um, um, the, this coalition to end Uyghur forced labor has been endorsed by over 300 uh, organizations all around the globe. And the organization I am currently working on, uh, working at is also one of the coalition members. So people, whoever is interested, please visit the enduyghurforcelabor.com to learn more information. Um, the only way that the corporates and brands can ensure that they're not being importing goods um, made with forced labor or in some way being complicit in the forced labor is to leave the Uyghur region entirely. And the brand commitment provides specific actions and guidance for brands to follow to prevent from being complicit. Um, so I ask people who are listening to this panel, um, please, uh, again, please check out the website where you'll be you will be able to find information about what can be done about the forced labor situation, what has been done, and who are the brands and corporates that are involved in forced labor. And I know that um, the brand commitment uh, provides steps that are not going to be easy for people to follow, but um, it is feasible. And I, uh, in the end of my talk here today, I would like to make few wishes. Um, as I am a selfish daughter, I would like to start my wish for my father first. I wish my father can be uh, released from the prison in China um, as soon as possible. I hope I can just receive a call this afternoon and say my father is out. And I wish all the other innocent people who have been wrongfully detained in China can be released and be united with their families soon, as soon as possible. And I am also very much looking forward to see more and more brands can sign on to the brand commitment to exit the Uyghur region. And my, um, uh, in, in, in order to do that, we will need um, consumers, whoever who is listening to this uh, panel, um, please push those brands to, to make that happen. And um, my last wish is, um, I hope all my wishes come true. And thank you all very much for having me today. I apologize, I will have to leave early today for a work engagement, but it is so nice to be invited to this event. Thank you, uh, Kaiseraka, for inviting me. And um, it's so nice to be here with amazing leading activists. Um, please continue the good work and stay safe during this crucial time and hope to see you all soon in another time. I, will, I promise I will stay longer next time. And thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for a, a really great introduction. Because we know you're going to have to leave soon, I'm actually just going to follow this up with um, a, a very short question before we move on to Nuri Turkel. Um, I was just wondering, I think this question of, of uh, labor conditions, uh, forced or coerced labor, super, super important. Uh, not just in the Uyghur region, but also on a global scale. And I think this is really one of the things that we, for the future, if we want a well-functioning world, need to be looking into much more closely. I was wondering if you were looking just at the Uyghur region or because you're working at, uh, at a, um, at, uh, at a, uh, with a group or an association that looks at it also in a global perspective, whether you can somehow connect this um, to a global perspective, because I think this is also one of the things we need to do in order to get people's attention focused on uh, the human rights abuses taking place in the Uyghur region that we need to connect it to larger topics. And then maybe secondly, I know this is going to be very difficult to, to do short, but uh, whether you could give us a bit of an idea if these brands move out of the Uyghur region altogether, what is how is this what is going to happen what what is the what is the idea what is the dream of the of the progression of this if you can do this in two minutes <laughs> before we move on or just give us a, a basic idea that we can use to, to think with further on in this discussion um for your first question um the for for many years i have been uh, 
working alone. I have tried, I haven't been working uh, officially in any organization. I've worked with a lot of people, but I've only worked um, by myself, but it is very difficult with one person's power. I realized that I need to work with people who are expert on this. I am, I, unfortunately, I myself is not an expert. So I decided to join the organization Worker Rights, Start, uh, Worker Rights Consortium, which is, uh, includes employees that are experts in forced labor crisis. And they have branches all around the world. They have field staffs all around the world focusing on forced labor crisis. And up to few, and until a few years ago, they started to adopt on um, this um, forced labor crisis in the Uyghur region, this, this specific issue. And they decided to uh, hire people who are knowledgeable or uh, who, who, who, who is very um, passionate about this cause. So I applied for the job and I decided that we can benefit um, uh, each other and contribute to the cause together since we all have the same goal, which is end Uyghur forced labor. And, and therefore that's why I am working uh, at this organization at, and on the specific issue. And my job title is actually a project associate for combating Uyghur forced labor specifically. And um, I really do hope um, with the help of leading um, uh, experts on this issue that we can uh, lead this to something positive in the future. Um, I know this is going to be a long fight because brands, they do care about their, um, uh, the, how much they sell, where they, uh, the benefits, the financial, uh, uh, the, the markets, etc. So it is going to be a long fight, but it is feasible. As I mentioned, it's going to be very difficult steps for them to take, but it is feasible. And we do have already have few brands that are agreed to sign on the call to action the brand's commitment. So that is a very good sign. We're hoping to get as many brands as possible. Uh, a lot of uh, things, a lot of uh, the brands are agreed to take actions, but are free to sign officially yeah. because of fear for uh, retaliation from the Chinese government. Um, and that is why we need more and more uh, brands to sign because if there's one brand or two brands are afraid of being retaliated, then that's that is even more important to have all, all brands to be unified at this at this stage. So China can uh, can target on one brand, two brands. Can they target twenty brands, forty brands, sixty right. brands, hundred brands? So that, that is why we need to work hard to make that happen to persuade more people to sign. And how do we persuade more brands? Which is a lot of sense. I, I think, unfortunately, I'll have to stop you because you need to go. And also, before Nuri Turka uh, gets on, I, these details are super relevant and super interesting. And I hope we can have you on at some other point um, to discuss them more in detail. So thank you very much. Thank and you. I will, thank you. And I will now, out, just out of time reasons, move directly on to Nuri Turka because I know that he will also have to leave quite soon. So... Um, Nuri, welcome and very great to see you. You have started your work a lot earlier than Juher uh, and you came along uh, a different path, so to speak. Maybe you could speak a little bit to how you got into working on the Uyghur issue, how you got into the position that you're in right now and what you see as the main issues and the main path forward for both activism, politics and academia in dealing with what is happening at the moment in the Uyghur regions. Please, you have the word, Nuri Turk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. First of all, I appreciate the organizers uh, to invite me to be part of this important conversation. I'm so glad to see my uh, fellow Uyghur friends and colleagues in this panel. Um, I've been uh, working on Uyghur human rights uh, almost two decades now. I came to the United States in 1995, uh, formally get involved in the Uyghur human rights work um, a year after the um, bloody crackdown of the uh, Wulju massacre. Uh, Wulju is my father's um, place of birth that has a, a direct relevance to my own uh, family. Uh, so fast forward, um, I have been immersed uh, in the ongoing crisis um, uh, addressing uh, the concerns, uh, engaging in public education, uh, engaging in media relations, uh, engaging with governments, 
making policy recommendations uh, since uh, early 2018. Uh, I mentioned this timeline because um, I never thought uh, being uh, in the center of the Uyghur um, advocacy in Washington, I never thought that we would see this level of uh, focus, interest uh, in the Uyghur uh, issue, um, the Uyghur's freedom struggle. Um, we would be dealing as a horrific uh, situation. It's a genocide. Uh, at the same time, we have been able to accomplish uh, uh, quite a few remarkable uh, uh, successful uh, uh, uh, progress in the uh, in the uh, the Uyghur advocacy work in Washington, in particular. I am um, I was appointed uh, to my current role uh, by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi this past May. Uh, before that, I served as the president of the Uyghur American Association um, and the uh, uh, previous director and the chairman of the board. Um, I'm not currently the president of the UAA, Uyghur American Association. But in addition to my um, uh, policy advocacy work, I'm also a full-time lawyer. Uh, I have been practicing law almost uh, 15 years now, uh, 15, 16 years. I'm currently also an in-house counsel for a European uh, uh, telecommunication giant. So I, I have different responsibilities. So um, focusing on what I do with, uh, with the US government, I'm a US government official. I am one of the nine commissioners uh, in the US uh, Commission on International Religious Freedom that was established with the mandate of 1998 uh, International Religious Freedom Act. Um, uh, the commissioners are appointed by the President of the United States um, and the leaders of the uh, Senate and the House. Um, uh, the, the term for commissioners is two years, uh, can serve up to four. Uh, the, the law that I mentioned earlier mandates that um, the commission uh, focuses on uh, the international religious freedom uh, document, report, and make recommendations to the President of the United States, Secretary of State, and Congress. Um, uh, this is a very important uh, role, uh, particularly for me, uh, because I came to the United States as an immigrant. Uh, this should be um, a, a kind of a model uh, for um, uh, European countries to also uh, look into the uh, immigrant uh, population. Actually, immigration is not a bad thing. Um, United States being an immigrant, immigrant country uh, gives uh, opportunities uh, to people who make home and become a contributing so uh, member of the society. Currently in the US government, there are two of us uh, with Uyghur background. And there's an official um, who is a China director at the National Security Council. And I have this responsibility mostly working on the issues outside of the United States of foreign policy, public advocacy. So because of my role, I focus highly and, and, and, and the, um, uh, deliberately on the foreign policy recommendation uh, to both uh, the United States government and the uh, US allies and partners. Uh, we all know that the China is a growing uh, global partner. But that should not be used as a defeatist uh, excuse for not doing anything. Uh, United States government has already uh, set the uh, example by showing historic and, and unprecedented responses uh, with the passage of the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act in, uh, in June and enactment uh, at the same month. Uh, we have a legislation mandate to address the Uyghur crisis, uh, along with um, uh, covering the issues that you have briefly touched, uh, the forced labor uh, prevention, and also uh, protection and, and, and um, reporting of uh, uh, Uyghur American community from a Chinese harassment. Uh, we also have uh, a mandate now that requires the United States uh, uh, State Department to investigate uh, no, excuse me, the report uh, and document uh, human rights abuses. 
and uh, this is this uh, the level of the industrial level of scale of uh, the oppression, the atrocities committed against Uyghur people by the Chinese government uh, cannot be handled by one specific country or government. And this is not about uh, Trump administration, this is about uh, US policy. Uh, for those of you who don't understand, uh, maybe who are not familiar with um, religious freedom issues in the United States, it is, it is considered as the first human rights. It is in the constitution, it's in the Declaration of Independence. So whenever the US government talks about uh, religious freedom, people should not mix it up with a certain political party were occupant of the White House. This is a bipartisan, bicameral uh, issue, as it has been demonstrated in the support that the Uyghur people enjoy in the US Congress. Uh, of those uh, 435 members of Congress, 100 senators, the Uyghur, um, Uyghur freedom movement enjoys uh, literally 97% of the support. Uh, if it's 100%, that would be a little uh, unusual, but uh, overwhelming uh, support have been uh, lent to the Uyghurs, uh, uh, Uyghurs cause. So this should be a model for other countries to consider. And uh, the Chinese have been uh, telling the international community exactly uh, uh, the, the way that I described as uh, linking uh, US position on certain issues with the Uyghur issue, uh, misinforming public that this is about hampering China. And also, uh, Dolkun, uh, my good friend Dolkun will, uh, uh, I'm sure, will touch upon the international institutions such as the UN, how it has become a, a, a tool for the Chinese to extend its oppression to, uh, uh, to countries around the world. And then um, I will, uh, during the Q&A session, um, I will be more than happy to discuss what government should do, what has been done in the United States, and what are the individual responsibilities and I, I have been also working um, uh, uh, diligently, uh, deliberately on forced labor prevention issues, both at home and abroad. And I'd be happy to address any questions, any issues that uh, involves uh, forced labor uh, policy and legislative issues. With that, I'd like to thank you again, uh, organizing this event, and I'm glad to be part of this discussion. Thank you very much. Um, that is really super valuable information, also especially as to how these different organs function uh, of especially the US uh, government and administration that we are so dependent on in so many ways to get things done on a global scale and not least in relation to the Uyghur region. So we will definitely return to you. We look forward to seeing you back uh, for the Q&A session. Thank you. Um, thank I'll you. be back. Great. So now we will move on to um, Razigul Asim, uh, who, as I said before, experienced uh, herself and uh, on her uh, relatives um, what the Chinese crackdown uh, and mass incarceration looked like when she, in 2017, returned to the region after having been away for quite a while, having settled uh, in Albania. And uh, Razigul, uh, welcome. It's great to have you here, and it's great that you stand forth and, and uh, tell us about your first-hand experience. That is a very brave and very important thing to do. Um, please, could you tell us a little, about, a little bit about your experience, what happened when you returned, uh, what did you see, and, and how has your family been treated um, in the region. Please, you have the word. Thank you. Thank you, Rohi. I'm very honored to today part of you talk about my written story. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, uh, uh, for inviting me this uh, evening. Uh, I, my name is Razi Wolasen. And I was I born in East Turkestan, uh, Korla, Korla uh, Chakla country. Um, actually, I finished university here and I work it 
after some reason, and I came to uh, Albania, I married Albanian. And I'm stay, staying like a simple person. I, I'm just like the mother, the, the wife. And I just stay in like, I don't know, uh, I didn't have nothing to do with Chinese government or nothing about this. And 2017, my father invited me to go home because it's a long time I didn't see him. He's a very old man. And I go, go home. And I take my two kids with me. And first day I got the airport is like a, a Shanghai airport. And there they, they, they check me a lot of time, like two hours, just to check in, just to ask me where you come from, where you go, who are you, this kind of questions. And after two hours, they let me go. And I stayed one night in, in, in Shanghai. And second day, I fly, fly uh, Urumqi. And I go to Urumqi, of course, they check me all through here. They ask like kind of same question. Of course, they are not taking me, they didn't come to this, but they ask me too much question and they check me my stuff. But after there, I go to Urumqi because I want to, I had to stay there because my home is very, very large from Urumqi. And that day, my brother come to me. Uh, he's just come to me, pick me up there. And I stay one night. But that day, when I go to hotel, I I enter hotel because they, they have to check their, our ID, ID card. I am using ID card here, not passport. When I come here in the, in the hotel, they check me passport. I don't know what, what is going on after I came a police in, in hotel. And they said me about my ID card. Your ID card is has a red point. The first time I hear about the red point, I'm thinking why I have red point, who I am, what what I did. But the, the police didn't tell me nothing, just to, they checked me my stuff, everything. And they asked me where, they, where you come from, what you did, where, who are you, that kind of question again, again. And I be very scary because I don't, I don't know what's going on. And even my brother, after that day, second day we moved to our country, I, I left, I leave. But from the, that time, I remember that it's very clearly that that day is morning. We left from Urumqi to go to Korla. We are going, but the, I they are too much place to check check us. Like I remember that maybe to, because I I'm too scared. Maybe something is I didn't remember good, but I guess like twelve station police station we have to get checking checking us. But every time my ID card is is is has a has a voice because when I go and they check my they are going to with my ID card and they are they are warning something I don't know and they every time the police come to check me and this is give me a very pressure and I am really I am going going very under pressure here and after I'm I come to Korla I stay again one night because uh, it's traffic is very far from from Korla. I have again. I have to stay one night, and that day I stayed my uh, sister's house because I cannot stay anywhere because I'm very afraid. And I stayed at my sister's home. But that time, that night, and uh, even police come to here. I don't know where they know, and also I I'm checking for the, by them. And second day, I come again my country, but they have a five station again. I have to pass, and every time pass, also same same thing, same warning my by my ID card and police coming also ask same question. And that day, I come home like I think like uh, seven o'clock. I arrive at my home, but the police is uh, come to my home that night and ask same question. And I sleep. 
Second day, I just get up. Uh, I think is I hear the police uh, police the cars is outside, and my family is they are very worried with this, and I stay at my home come to like ten police, and they just let me stay there, and they they began to ask questions. After they take uh, take me my passport, they, and uh, uh, my passport and my telephone, and they take. Me. And they said, "You don't have to get up, got up from your your home, just inside, and we will we will you check you, and you don't have to talk to anybody here, even your husband." I said, "Okay," and they go. But after that. Uh, every day, uh, sweet, one day, three times, police come to check me in my home, and I stay. Uh, this is pacing by day by, but uh, I try to contact my husband. But police say to me, don't, don't, you don't have to, you don't, you don't, you cannot uh, conduct this. But this is give me very pressure because the, my husband he don't know my my problem, what is going on there, and they are. Maybe he's worrying my kids because they are, they are too small, my kids. And I try to tell my uh, relative to contact my husband. And my husband knows what's going mm -hmm. on there. Ex-husband, of course. And after uh, after one day, police said to me, after, after one week, a police said to me, go to police station. Because my home is like... A, uh, like uh, 20 meter from the police station, and from police station I go and I, of course, is my my, uh, my company to to police with me, and I go to police station, and they ask me again same questions, same I don't know same question who are you this kind of questions. After they send me home, I go go home, but after after two weeks. They again call me to go go police station, and I go. But after this time, I go and I didn't go out from like I stayed three days inside. They not do nothing bad, very bad to me. But they take me, let me blood. They said they will they will check me, and they ask me a lot of question about the. Uh, we were Congress because I was in 10, uh, 2014. I was one time in Germany. I think maybe they check uh, check up, check up this and they ask about this and anything about the Uyghurs, what they do, who you meet them, who's uh, you, what you do in, in outside China. This kind of questions. Of course, I told them what I did because I never did something wrong here. And after uh, after three days, of course, they are not treating very bad, but just one time, I eat one time, uh, they give me food. And after I I go out, they, I go home. Of course, they let me go home. And I think like after one, maybe 20 days later, the police come again to my home. And they said, uh, we sent you. And at that time, they called the concentration camp. They call a uh, school of party. I don't know. They call like this. And they said, we sent you a uh, school of party. OK, I said. And I take my kids because nobody can take care of their own. I don't have uh, nothing there. My related, but they cannot. So I tell them I have to take my kids. OK, they said. But I go to a consultation camp. I stayed one day. And I don't know what's the reason here. I stay after uh, is, uh, afternoon. The uh, police come again to send me home. They said you have to stay in the home. Uh, after three days, they come to uh, uh, government. Some people from government and they said to me, you can apply your passport. You can take, but you have to do. You have to write some promises to us. And that time when I in in home, this problem is every uh, Monday I have to go to uh, uh, uh, because they have uh, rising uh, flags 
every Monday and I have to go to the, uh, the flags. I forgot to tell this. And everybody go, of course, it's, uh, it's my home. Everybody is who's uh, called Uyghur, they go, not Chinese people. And we go there and the afternoon, they, we finish the uh, rising flags. They, they will have one kind of meeting. And every day, two people to go to talk about the why is Uyghurs is terrorist? Why? Because we are tourists. That's why we have to take what Chinese government do to us. That kind of things we have to talk. And everybody has to talk. Even I have I had to talk because I write about this. Why is outside China is very bad than inside China? What I serve outside. And what I, what is um, party, Communist Party is more good than other countries, this kind of things, anyway. And uh, after I applied my visa, my passport, sorry, and uh, I stayed like uh, for the, take my passport, like I stayed like a kind of one month because I had to go too much place to take them, take them sign to it. And after my husband come, come because uh, he, uh, that there till now, I they, that he didn't allow, it, but I don't know, they allowed or he's come. This is, I am not very sure. And he come and uh, take me from, you know, uh, go, go back to uh, Albania. But uh, when I come Albania, I have taken at, uh, still the pressure from Chinese government because I cannot work. If I work, they, they, they said me Chinese, uh, the company say to you are Uyghur, you cannot work here. So I, I slimed, actually I slimed because I'm thinking maybe I, my slime is good to, for my family or I slimed, I slimed, but they never let me, let me stay in slime. And that's why I'm now I'm talking, this is my story. And I want to say in Uyghur France, don't be slimed. Because if we are slime, they they're happening again. They are still still do same things to us we will in, in East Turkestan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your both for your personal story to share that with us it must be very difficult for you and very emotional for you. And also thank you for calling uh, to all of the Uyghurs who have experienced similar things, but also everybody actually who know about this to not be silent, but to speak up about this. This is extremely important and that is what we are trying to contribute to here. Now, I will now turn to Dolkun Isa, um, the president of the World Uyghur Association. The World Uyghur Association here was mentioned as something that the Chinese were asking Razigul about when they were interrogating her. Um, we can all be shocked about the way they were approaching her and again and again, and how they kept interrogating her, asking the same questions over and over again. Now, I would like to ask you, because you've been dealing with these issues for a very long time. You've de been dealing with the repression of Uyghurs in China um, for several decades. Now, what Razigul here describes uh, of the police visits and the extreme surveillance. Is that a normal experience? Do a lot of Uyghur, ha have a lot of Uyghur had this experience and how long has this been the case? Um, how did uh, things develop into this very difficult situation? Um, on top of that, I would also just like to ask you um, to tell a little bit about your own work uh, for the World Uyghur Association. Um, and where you see uh, the future work going, the future effort being put into. Thank you. You have the word, Dolkunisa. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon for us. Good, afternoon, good morning, maybe, friends in Washington. And I uh, would like to thank Museum of Movement and the Uyghur Pen jointly organized the side event and this panel. And I also appreciate uh, giving the voice to speak about the ongoing Uyghur genocide 
And I'm also very happy today sharing the same panel with uh, my good friend Nuri, uh, commissioners, and Jawhar, and uh, my good friends Kaiser, Razgul, and uh, Saira Gul, all. Uh, it is really uh, amazing. <clears throat> well, uh, well, to the Congress, uh, all work, we are mostly doing advocacy work. And because then, the, uh, so far, uh, recently, uh, so many people on the world, and no idea on the Uyghur issue, I mean, no idea on the Uyghurs. Uh, but actually, uh, the Uyghur issue is the, has a long history. The problem has a, a not a new problem because most of them people just are talking on uh, just the Uyghur issue and also problem uh, which uh, has the face for the Uyghur just happening recently. Yes, it's wrong. Uh, have a long history. Actually, this uh, problem has been started since occupation 1949. Eastern Kazakhstan has been occupied by uh, Chinese Communist Party. Since then, this uh, problem was starting. Uh, but nobody knows this issue because uh, it's, there is a several reasons, of course, why the, most of people uh, just know recently this. So what do the Congress uh, mean propose uh, in the, in the rises we will atrocity to the international, to the United Nations? Uh, we are, since they established, we are very uh, involved with uh, UN, uh, particularly UN human rights mechanism and the European institution, European Parliament, uh, European Commission, European External Service. And also we are uh, working very closely right? we will issue to different of government and the national parliament, national government and the civil society, international NGOs. Uh, and also we are trying to help the Uyghur uh, refugees uh, case because Uyghur refugees is one of the uh, critical issue for us and the time to time Uyghurs escape from uh, China, from Uzbekistan because of the Chinese repression policy. Uh, then some, uh, most of some country, particularly uh, neighboring country, forcibly deported to the refugees to, to, to China. Uh, even every day we had such a uh, horrible news. Yesterday, one of the Uyghurs was detained in Saudi Arabia as well. And one of them is Turkey, someday some other part. This is the one kind of job as well to your Congress, yes saying that we will refuse life. Uh, yeah, so so far, uh, since established, we are doing s s such kind of work. And I'm, as you say, I'm the uh, president of the World Trade Congress since 2017, but I uh, was the co-founder of the World Trade Congress. But China, uh, as I said, was what we come trying to rise this institution internationally, but Chinese government trying to uh, hide in this reality. Chinese government never uh, uh, allowed or Chinese government trying to push this issue, not being to the international issue, to uh, uh, uh, trying to just uh, in the uh, hiding from the international, uh, it is easy to crack down the Uyghur. So, that's why time to time, what we Congress, we had faced a lot of difficulty because Chinese government blamed me, me as a terrorist. What we will Congress, uh, there's a terrorist organization. Uh, so for, uh, most of the world had very little information. So we that's why sometimes we had faced a really difficult uh, situation. But however, we had continued fight on our right. Uh, today is we will issue one of the uh, well-known international issue, uh, but uh, as I say, this is not new issue. But current situation is uh, is dire. Uyghur community is suffering incredible. Uh, the action of the Chinese government has put in very existence Uyghur people on the street. In the particular last four years alone, uh, she uh, Chen Chengo, uh, who is the part Chinese Communist Party secretary in the Strict and Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. He was the party secretary in Tibet from 2011 to 2016. When he was the party secretary in Tibet, he used a brutal way, cracked on the Tibetan people as well. Then he was he uh, was the appointed party secretary in Uzbekistan in, in the Uyghur region. Then he used the, his experiment and all the Uyghur region, he turned and opened a prison. Uh, yes, today we can. Uh, and he, he completely turned all the Turkestan in the uh, police state. 
And the Chinese government has subject uh, last four years, we can say, to the Uyghur people to uh, mass arbitrary detention. Uh, we don't know exactly the number, but we believe at least, at least 3 million people are suffering in concentration camp. But uh, suffer, uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, 14th of September this year, Chinese government first time give 100 number. As, uh, he published white paper and then saying each year, since 2014, each year 1.3 million will be subject to the education. It is mean uh, if you calculate the since six years, then uh, around 8 million, 7.8 million uh, Uyghur uh, subject to the re-education. And also Uyghurs uh, uh, subject to mass sterilization, uh, particularly Uyghur women and other first birth prevention measures in order to diminish the Uyghur population. This actually Chinese has a long history. This, this one child policy start 1984 uh, uh, and also forced labor of the modern slavery on 10,000, uh, 100,000 Uyghur people, uh, recently ASPIE, the Australian National uh, Strategy Policy Institute, published a report saying 82,000 Uyghur uh, transport to the other provinces in China to subject uh, forced labor. Uh, and all attempt to destroy unique Uyghur ethnic identity and to uh, possible assimilate Uyghur people into Han central uh, China. And destruction of the physical repression of your identity, including thousands of mosques and graves and other side of the religious, cultural, and historical importance to the Uyghur people. Uh, and there uh, is an SP report also uh, saying since 2017, more than 8,000 mosques completely destroyed, another 8,000 is partly destroyed, uh, and banned also Uyghur language. So many schools of public space. Chinese government, uh, actually this is the Uyghur language, religious freedom is uh, one of the uh, uh, freedom, basic, not only basic freedoms, international convention, international law, also guaranteed by the Chinese constitution, the autonomous law. Chinese government not only violated international law, but also violated its own constitution. According to the, uh, according to the autonomous law, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Law, Uyghur language, one of the first language, one of the official language. But today is forbidden uh, uh, since 2004. Uh, several religious persecution, including, for example, uh, ban of growing uh, bread, wearing Islamic dress, and the uh, own of Quran, separate and uh, uh, forbidden fasting. Uh, this is the start 2014, 2015. And separating Uyghur children from this parents. And uh, German scholar Andreas Zahn saying is around 800,000, around 800,000 Uyghur children separate from the uh, family. They are uh, subject indoctrinate and uh, uh, to be a royal and, uh, ro and the indoctrination royalty to CCP and the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping. And also uh, harassment, punishment, and the Uyghur diaspora, not only Chinese government. Uh, uh, punishments of Uyghurs in the inside districts and also uh, because Chinese law are getting longer and longer internationally uh, trying to and, uh, uh, ask and the uh, Uyghur diaspora and who uh, in diaspora anyone who uh, dare to speak and immediately Chinese government use different of the hostage diplomacy uh, and use different of way and trying to uh, push and silence. I'm one of them uh, person of this, I have been suffering more than 21 years by the uh, red notes by the Interpol. You know, until 2018 February, until my red notes was delayed, I was detained so many country borders. And uh, yeah, uh, even in Europe, even in Europe and the different uh, some other country. Uh, and the 2017 Chinese government uh, completely kept. Uh, communication between Uyghur diaspora and also Uyghur fa family. Uh, I can say more than 90, 95% Uyghur who live in exile, Europe, United States, Turkey, or also world, have a lot of contact from family member. Uh, we, we, we, we, we just we got if uh, some heartbreaking news was happening in the our family. I personally also, uh, I got uh, since 2017, middle of April, I have lost my, I lost the contact with my family member. Uh, but 2018, uh, 
uh, middle of June, I got first heartbreaking news, my mother died. Uh, and uh, this is just the news, but I, I don't know what, what condition uh, she passed away. But later I learned from the international media, she died one of the Chinese concentration camp. And the beginning of the 2020, this year, January, beginning of January, I got second heartbreaking news, my father died. But still, I have no idea what condition my father died. Uh, even I, I, have, I don't know, I, I, I have no idea. And uh, where is the, uh, his, his cemetery is? Yes. This is a 21st century. The century communication is not a problem at all, but it is a big problem for us today. Uh, this is the old things going on now, and just uh, uh, Razgul Asim, she, she, she explained what kind of, uh, uh, because she, she, she was not activist, uh, she has no any criminal uh, uh, things, but just she went to the strict stand for the family visit, visit, but she explained what kind of problem she had, you know. This is the this is just the example. What I'm saying, what what the Rasgul Asim saying today is the very general situation. The Uyghur uh, community, most of them people just talking about uh, the, the people who live in this concentration camp. Three million people, four million people. Some uh, international uh, scholars say over the one million people. However, not problem is not only the problem is the uh, people who live in concentration camp. But rest of the million, Chinese government saying we will population 20 million, but we believe more than 20, 25 uh, 5 million. Whatever, 20 million or 12 million, rest of them, um, 20, 24 million people who live on the outside the camp, also the same problem. Because Chinese government already turned the whole region as a, as, uh, as a police state and the surveillance technology. Uh, area is a, a face recognition, voice recognition camera, uh, and every movement, every daily life, and the threaten and the monitoring by the Chinese Communist Party, Chinese Police Security Service, that and the people maybe is outside the people. There is a, maybe some advantage they can uh, eat them on time, on time, uh, and maybe you can eat them with food on time, but they are uh, feeling not safe, they don't know, they are, they are staying with the fear every moment because next or next day, what will be happening? Nobody knows because yes. you don't have a right to ask what is the reason. So simply because you burn Uyghur, because you your ethnicity, you can very simply take uh, to the concentration camp and disappear. Uh, this is the uh, situation, so we are all to the Congress trying to rise to, to issues internationally, what's the, all the things now is so many camp survivor is that made testimony. Maybe we will listen uh, up to me, it was a Saira rule. And exactly. Yes, yeah, some many other yes. camp, camp survivor also uh, talking so many international uh, media reported. So no, it is no uh, any reason to silence. Uh, it is a genocide. Uh, yeah, so I, I have to s s stop maybe. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for a lot of information and a lot of uh, commitment also, which is very, very important. And again, the call for speaking up. Now, you've mentioned a lot of very, very uh, important topics that unfortunately we don't have time to cover in detail today. We could be talking for hours about both the surveillance um, and also the, the different kind of repressions um, that the, go the Chinese government puts on Uyghurs outside um, of China that you have ex been experiencing yourself. But you mentioned several times and also the others have mentioned the camps and the uh, witnesses um, that have spoken out about the camp, camp survivors. And uh, we are so lucky here to have one of the most courageous and one of the most important witnesses of the camps with us, uh, Saira Gul Saudbayeva. She um, served as a teacher in one of the camps and saw some of the really horrific treatment of the camp. Inmates also experienced it on her safe her own body before uh, several months later she was able to escape to Kazakhstan. So now let us go into the inside of the camps from a uh, camp survivor's personal experience. Please, Saira Gül, uh, we have spoken to each other many times before. Um, 
I know your story and I know the courage it has taken for you to, to stand um, before everybody and, and talk about this. I would like you to tell us, um, unfortunately, shortly, uh, your personal story and what conclusions you draw from it. Yeah, for raising for languages, uh, I'm the interpreter for Sayra Gul. So she will talk in uh, her languages. So I will be interpreting to the English. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, Vlad. I'm going to be talking to you in the English language. I'm going to be talking to you in the English language. I'm going to be talking to you in the English language. I'm going to be talking to you in the English language. First of all, I have to be appreciated for the organizer, especially the the Malmo Culture the, the Moments Museum, as well as other organizer. So, at the same time, I really appreciate for other colleagues on this panels, uh, which have presented that the uh, the situation in East Turkestan. Uh, my name is uh, Saira Gul Saudbayo. I am ethnically Kazakh in the uh, Shinyang Uyghur Autonomous Region. I'm born in the Kazakh Autonomous Bast. Uh, the East Turkestan is our ancestors' homeland, and we are uh, centuries living here from the long, long time ago. And uh, our country, East Turkestan, has been occupied in 49 by the CCP. Since then, we are under their control. Uh, when I was in East Turkestan, I was uh, working as a uh, Doctor, medical doctor, as well as that uh, the kindergarten, as the chief of the kindergarten. Uh, this uh, today situation in Turkestan is not simply was that uh, recently has happened, but was it long ago the Chinese government had a plan for such. Uh, the Turkic uh, uh, group in East Turkestan, like Uyghur, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, they want to erase them from this country uh, and in ethnically. Uh, they actually is the beginning of 90s they already had started like a, a burst control in our region and uh, that's the maybe is the beginning of the how the others are tightening our situation for more in that uh, pushing to erasing these nations from that region as well as uh, we can see that from 2006 that the chinese government is a change the education policy so there is a no anymore like uh, Local the autonomous region languages or minority languages in schools so or education system. Uh, For this reality is a forcing as our the Kazakh, as our family. Then we decide to move to Kazakhstan, which our neighbors. So that was at that time I we are preparing for a move to Kazakhstan from China. But unfortunately, I'm not lucky enough to apply for passport. Uh, Therefore, this reason, uh, as a family member, I stayed because I had no passport. 
stay in the home in uh, China. I was in New York region. And, uh, my two child and my husband, uh, actually my husband is retired from his uh, teaching job. He was teacher, of course. So then uh, the family member was moved to Kazakhstan, but not me. Uh, so I can say that uh, from the 2016, the China is that uh, starting this uh, camp for the genocide for our uh, Turkic ethnicity in the Xinjiang Uyghur region. Uh, from at the times of my neighbors, my colleagues, my friends, my family members, day by day they are just disappearing for somewhere else. We don't know where they are taken. So it's the how I feel as scary in this time. There's not only me, there's all around me, the who I know, and the, even the whole the, the region, I believe. The, we had to prepare for all our clauses, the all kinds of clauses, or so prepare for the bag. Maybe tonight or sometime the immediate deposits will become take as. And we had to prepare for our baggage. Otherwise, we will be taken with, without clothes. So this is how we are stressing all the time. When is my turn? Is coming for me. Then from 2017, I also part of this uh, uh, genocide policy. So that uh, 2017, one, one day at the midnight, the police come to my home and uh, take me to the police station without asking anything. They beat me and uh, asking my viewers of my family. They are in Kazakhstan. Uh, this kind of taking from home with the unknown time as they want, it's repeat again many times for my personally, uh, release and take, release, take. Uh, then uh, 2017 in November, I officially was uh, appointed as a teaching as a Chinese language in the camp for those detainees. Uh, the first uh, I have to do is I have to sign for one uh, a conditional agreement to which I have to keep the secret of this, what I see in this camp. So I have to sign on paper first. Uh, uh, the year I was teaching that was in that camp around the 2,500 people, they included uh, all the uh, young women, men, and uh, the, everyone has been shackled, as well, everyone has been in the uh, the hair was taken for that. Uh, uh, so uh, I am the teaching for them and the camp for Chinese. Uh, the, among them, all kinds of people I can see the businessmen, teachers, or intellectual, or the, the, all kind of the people uh, was uh, inside in this camp. And they are especially they are targeting those the intellectual first, of course. <laughs> 
kamera urnatılmakan kamerasız öyde bunu özür karı öyde pataydı aşk karı öy öyde ulağa tüsürdük rezil vasıtlığın paydanıp adamlara kıynaş cazılaş ekparıdır. Uh, the one thing I would like to mention is that uh, some rooms in this concentration camp is a result that the camera uh, sensory, the camera control in that room, what is going on, we don't know. But we know that's the kind of the cell which they are torturing is all uh, unimaginable uh, way of torturing those uh, camp people. Adamla kamalgan kameralar bilen karidolların en bir yerge putunlayma akıllı kameralar ornatılgan bolıp bir yedeki kamalgan adamların erbe işerge zikrim tersi at kızı tüştü bolıdı. The other part of the, the except that the special room, the other part of the whole camp everywhere is a Soviet camera and the controller there is all activity with everything and the everywhere. Ayalar bilen kızlar kızlar ne o yedi ayalar bilen kızlar için Jenny, <gülüyor> Uh, subjugated very badly and uh, they, they, they were very badly by for the police or someone someone else in that uh, inside the camp uh, uh, raping them and uh, sterilization for the women especially for that uh, the all kind of unbelievable uh, things is happening in this camp um, Çarda kuralların köyüne vakta öz gözüm özüm şen bilim. Eğer köz bilim pembeye adam olsa, şigirin birinci esirde mi olmuşsun da çarda kuralları var diye ki, herkes şen etti. As a teacher, when I have the chance into those cells, which are torturing those people, when I saw those, uh, those tools, equipment, whatever, so that the, how they are torturing, using those things for those people, if I'm not seen by my own eye, I don't believe such things in 21st century still exist. İşkemi 18 üçüncü ayda ulamene kampadan elip gelip hem de ulamene kaytadan cemiyet çizgisi de bir de üç yıllık aşı paşetli kozda bir kamaydı anlarını uxta adı. In 2018 in March, they change for their detention way of me and they say that I have been like sent to the other detention center for three year. This is official. Uh, uh, how do you say the internet to the, the camp? So the, I know I have been experienced in many years in the camp, so I know everything what's going on, the situation I understand well. So if I take to again for this camp, I don't think I will become out in life. So I decide that finally escape from China to Kazakhstan. Uh, So uh, why I decided that anyway I will die. So better let me try. To, before I die, I have to meet with my children who is in my neighboring country in Kazakhstan. So I just tried to go to push me to the, this uh, difficult way to escape from China to Kazakhstan. And I'm lucky enough to come to the Kazakhstan and met with my two children. Kazakistan'da, Kazakistan Milli Kavuşsuz Gider Sarıbeden tutulup, olan beni kıtayağa kaydırıp etmek gibi oldu. Lekin Kazakistan halkı beni kıtayağa kaydırıp etmek gibi oldu. En birisi karşı durdu. Ondan halkıralık mətbuatların en birisi bu işini yazıp kötüye geldiğin ki, aşında korkup beni birinci katıp kıtayağa kaydırma etmek oldu. So, uh, when I escaped from the China, I decided what I saw this the Bertol uh, concentration camp, Uh, what I saw those things, I had to uh, 
tell that the media for that the all situation in the world must be now what's going on in this fascistic camp. So when I come to Kazakhstan, the Kazakhstan uh, police department, they want to deport me back to China, but the, the Kazakh people, they are not allowing them to do so. So they have been stopped it. And as well as that, the, the world the human rights organizations, uh, such as UN uh, organizations, they are, uh, they are helping me to stop to deport to China. Kazakhstan, uh, Çigirdan kanun sürüdü deyken, deyken bir de ayıplıp, mene türmüge, sonra da üyede tokuz ay türmüde otladım. But anyway, that uh, in Kazakistan I also have been uh, detained for nine months in prison and uh, I waited that year. Kazakistan hükümeti mene siyasi panaklık tülüge ötmüşünden red kaldı, ola beğenmedi man. Yani işkin çıkıptan yeni hıhtayga kaytırış kapıya düş geldim. So during this uh, nine months time, I applied for uh, Kazakhstan as an asylum, for political asylum, but I have been uh, refused. They are not accepting my application. But I'm lucky enough for United, uh, United Nations Human Rights Organization helped me reset on to the Sweden here. So later, I come to Sweden with my family. So that uh, I first of all I really appreciate for the, the Swedish government who give me the second life for leaving me as a free country like that. I really appreciate since then I'm trying to all my best to the telling the story which I had experienced in the camp. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, to my hope for those audience and others, the politicians in the world who are listening, who uh, is uh, attending for this conference, is, is I would like to tell them this is not between China and the United States, uh, like uh, economy war or something else, but this is more serious matter. Uh, this is not only for the, the East Turkestan people, this is for human beings, for worldwide. As a human being, we have to stand up to stop such brutal fascistic uh, regime in China. Uh, for as I know, this, this United States government was uh, declared this is the uh, ethnic genocide, and I also wish this is the worldwide, all the countries that uh, recognize this is the ethnic genocide which is happening in China. The last I would like to ask for that as a President Trump has, has been signed for those people for the Uyghur uh, there is not a Uyghur Human Rights Law uh, Act for that signed paper. I would like to this uh, act is uh, in the real. It's not only for United States, but other uh, countries in the world also 
to support this Weaver Act uh, law in the United States has been signed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your witness account and also for your conclusions and thoughts about it. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Saira Gul has just published a book about her experiences. It's come out in German, but it will also appear in English, uh, I think, next summer. Um, these are very important witness accounts and her um, experiences need to be uh, told to the world and spread to the world. One of the things that uh, you mentioned Saira Gul is also the help that you have gotten after all from, you mentioned the American government uh, that has recognized what is going on in East Turkestan uh, as uh, a genocide um, from the Swedish government who is hosting you now and also from the Kazakhstani people that would not let you be extradited to China. So I think in between all these uh, stories of of suffering and of, of, of terrible, uh, violent and oppressive structures, we also see small glimpses of solidarity and hope that I think that we can hold on to. One of the things you mentioned in connection with this, and also all of you others actually have mentioned this, is the threat of being silenced. Um, and Kaiser, I know as uh, the president of the Uyghur Pen, uh, you are one of the people working hard against this silencing because one way to silence a whole people is actually also to stop their voices from within the people. And that is the, often the writers and poets. Um, and you've been working now for a long time on the imprisonment um, and detention and also the, the pressure put on Uyghur intellectuals and writers, especially detention in China itself, um, but also pressure on them outside. So now I would like you just in the last few minutes we have to give us a, a brief overview of how the situation is, how your work is proceeding. And then maybe also, because we haven't really gotten to that yet, mention um, why this uh, panel is called Never Again. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, you who, who decided to call it that um, and what that connects to and how you, how you see this issue. You have the word, please, Kaiser. So much for your moderate such wonderful panel. The first of all, of course, I appreciate for uh, Malmo culture, our friend Friedrich Henning, which has been used as this opportunity to talk here. Uh, yes, as you, as you mentioned, this freedom of expression is a basic human rights. Everyone should speak. It's given by creator, not allowed taken by any others. So this is very basic. Uh, rights we have. But today, the Uyghurs or oh, the East Turkestan people like Uyghur Kazakh and other Turkic minority have not such rights. As you mentioned, in more than a decade from 2006 or five, I started uh, working with Pan International. Pan International is standing up for without any border, without any ethnic background, any political background, whomever, everyone must have this right for freedom of expression. But uh, in our country, where we born, calling East Turkestan, uh, it's Chinese called the Uyghur Autonomy Region. Autonomy means rule by yourself. But unfortunately, we don't have such rights since this occupation. Maybe in the beginning, we have some for autonomic linguistic and translation writers, but as well as a very basic uh, education writers, but after 90s, there is not such writers. The autonomy I mean is the people have to rule by themselves. But today, there is a, uh, after especially this, this 2016 or 15, we can see there is about more than 360, which we have been listed by our some researcher, uh, the intellectuals, especially for the professors, uh, lecturers, or writers, artists, and publishers has been taken by the uh, police to unknown place we don't know, maybe imprisoned, maybe the, uh, somehow they are forcibly disappeared. So we don't know. That's, uh, we have no evidence and I can't tell you where they are exact. 
until uh, they are released or they are come out, we can't justify it either. So such situation is more horrible uh, as our uh, colleagues in the before from Jahar uh, and uh, Tel Sairagu, everyone has been mentioned that the all that situation, I don't need to repeat it again. So uh, today uh, as a pen, we really stand up to for to speak it up. Silence is just another kind of genocide. If you're silent, you will disappear. You have to stand up and you have to def defend your own rights. For this reason, we call those friends, give us this opportunity to talk as a uh, like country like Sweden or, Sweden or Scandinavia. This, you know, this part of world have no idea. They cannot think about that. If even we're telling this story, and of course, sometimes I also don't believe what I am telling, what I am saying. I ask myself, is that still is happening? Unbelievable story. So the Swedish people is difficult to understand that as well. For this reason, uh, we, we were pan and did that the Malmo culture uh, moments museum. We uh, have been managed this part of the safe haven program. So I really appreciate for everyone's attending here. Of course, that because of the time, it's uh, until four o'clock. Maybe you have given time for asking question. I don't know. So I had to stop here because all other my colleagues have been already have been told all story. Of course, there is an endless story. We can continue many, many hours, many, many days, maybe years. So I appreciate the uh, one. So uh, please, if there is any other question for any other panelists, other speakers, so they are probably welcome to answer us for that. Thank you very much, Kaiser. Um, we actually don't have any questions, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know if that's due to technical problems of getting the questions here. Um, of course, there are many questions and I have many questions for each of the speaker, but uh, we also uh, have run out of time and we need to wrap up. So I thank you very much for getting together. We have touched on a lot of very important topics that can be fleshed out further. We have introduced the speakers and where they work. So um, they can be accessed via email through their working places and you can approach uh, all of us, including myself, to get more information about um, what has been going on. And for the last, um, uh, part of the session today. I am um, wrapping up and passing on the word to Frederick Elk, who has been uh, um, organizer of this session. So thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you to everybody who was here. And uh, please, Frederick, you have the last word. Thank you so much, Luna. And thank you to you and for your very strong and very brave testimonies. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you. Those of you who are not here in, in our space for your valuable knowledge, thank you for sharing so much to us. And uh, thank you, it was very important, very important talk, very important information that we got. And as you mentioned, this is part of the Safe Havens Conference that is usually a physical meeting, but in times of COVID, we meet over the internet. So every month we have a Freedom Talk and the Freedom Talks are part of the Safe Havens Conference. The next session in the conference will be on December 3rd at 1.30 Central European time uh, when we have a two uh, round table discussions with Farida Shahid and Karim Abdenoun and some very prominent and important organizations in the arts rights justice sector for for freedom of speech and artistic freedom. So welcome then. And again, thank you so much everyone for, for, for talking and everyone who joined us and watched us. Thank you so much. Thank you.